Hello, we are here with Arthur Bruno, CEO of Create Entertainment, who are working on the ARPG Grindom. Um, so, Arthur, it's been a while since we chatted. Um, what has been going on? A whole lot of developing. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, let's see. Let, uh, last time we chatted, it was prior to alpha release, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite quite a long time ago, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we've we got the alpha of the game out since then, and uh, it's been out since... I think June. Mm -hmm. um, people, I mean, some people are putting in hundreds of hours. I mean, we've got one guy who has, according to his Steam account, put in over a thousand hours Jeez. playing the game. I don't even know how that's possible because it's, I mean, it's really basically like Act One. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, so we rolled that out, uh, you know, last, I guess, early summer, um, released uh, the fourth. Uh, class mastery, the uh, Nightblade, and uh, we've done a bunch of builds since then. I think our initial release was build eight. We're getting ready to put out build sixteen now, which will have some interesting uh, enhancements for people. Uh, we did a little bit of a graphical enhancement and um, uh, put in some quest markers uh, once you get close enough to to the objective. Uh, just because the world is is very open, so it's been easy for people to get turned around, um, bumped up enemy damage a little bit, and uh, various other balancing tweaks, and then we're getting real close to finishing Act 2, which we hope to have out late December or, you know, maybe sometime in January, um, depending on how much, you know, testing is required to get it all working. Yeah, so, I mean, in the, in the because this is, this is an alpha, and it's kind of been weird watching this develop. Obviously, it was a Kickstarter, and then it was um, then it appeared on Steam as early access. I mean, how how far now are you? It, would you say that you're into alpha? You know, before B. I know you're saying you you got Act Two still to put in, but you know, roughly on your development timeline, which is probably impossible to figure out. You know, yeah. where about, whereabouts are you? Do you think you are with it now? Uh, I mean, it's it, it is really kind of a strange project because normally um, you know you'd be developing a lot of tech uh, alongside of um, you know producing the content and you'd be building up to some sort of a you know a single release basically mm. um, at least that's the way it was done back in back in the old days back in 2006 when we released Titan Quest <laughs> seems so long ago now um, you know, but now it's like we try to get the game out as early as possible so people can start playing it and giving us feedback. And so on one hand, it's very, it's technically far along in terms of development. I mean, it's pretty playable. There's still some bugs and it's, you know, there's performance issue. It's not, it's not fully optimized yet, but I mean, it's pretty playable. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, the content development is, is, you know, lagging behind and that we still have a ways to go on that. So, uh, you know, in terms of playability, I mean, I'd say it's close to beta. Maybe it is beta. I mean, it's it's probably not far off from a, a finished game in terms of playability. But in terms of actually finishing all of the content, technically, we're not at beta yet, and we have a ways to go. Sure. Um, you know, so it's kind of weird because I feel like, it, you know, there's kind of a... a schism between the, the technical terms and kind of the way that we use them now in development where they're more kind of general estimations of where the, the product is, you know. So, I so mean, it's, do, do, you, do you kind of think, um, looking back at how you developed Titan Quest and so on, I mean, do you think things have really changed for you, the way that you approach, and have you had to adapt to the way the industry is now and how things have changed as far as development's concerned, especially for an indie title like this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely changed a lot, um, you know, because the biggest thing really is once the game is out there in the wild and people are playing it, um, you have more of a, a sort of a burden to keep the game highly playable, to squash bugs, um, to fix major balancing issues or things that just aren't working for people. And so that tends to slow down your forward progress because you're you spend a lot of time you know, sort of doing polishing before the polishing phase. Mm. Um, you know, because people people want to have fun, they want to be able to enjoy what's what's out there, and you want them to enjoy what's out there because it's you know sort of 
the world's first impression of the game. Um, so you end up sort of uh, doing polishing while you're in the middle of development, mm. which you know is slows things down a little bit. You also have to be more careful as you try to introduce new things into the game because you don't. I mean, in normal sort of closed development. You put out, you know, you re sort of release something into the, the closed company version of the game and it, it may break all kinds of things and then you spend a month fixing it. And we can't really do that. I mean, while we have people playing the game, you know, we have to keep it playable. So uh, it's, it's a little, it's more delicate trying to release big changes or new features mm -hmm. and, you know, put in, you have to keep constantly testing instead of having one sort of testing cycle towards the end mm -hmm. of development. I mean, one of, one of the things that um, you've, so even before um, this early access stage and so on, one of the things that's always been a bit of a hurdle for you guys is, is manpower. Um, it's, you know, I think one of the motivations behind your Kickstarter was obviously to try and ramp the team up somewhat. But I mean, you've also had other problems this year, um, personal problems, well, for want of a better word, which was lead poisoning. Yeah. Tell us about the lead poisoning. Oh, God. I mean, it's uh, the one thing I, I have to say to our credit is that, you know, uh, I, f I think a lot of, um, you know, sort of business premises are based on kind of a fair weather strategy. And uh, we've certainly not had fair weather. So I, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, I, I guess that sort of lends some, some credit to what we're doing, that we've been able to get the game out despite everything that's happened. I mean, we've had... Uh, I mean, other than just the sort of financial struggle early on, um, the issues with like PayPal, I don't know if you heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it, I mean, just talking about that briefly, it's kind of funny because now it's like industry standard that everybody uses PayPal to crowdfund their pre-development game, whereas when we did it, PayPal was like, oh, you know, you can't do this. We don't allow, you know, uh, people to, to pay for a product that isn't, you know, that's more than 20 days away from shipping, they told us, and, you know, whatnot. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, so yeah, there was the, the whole lead issue in our last apartment. Um, uh, I mean, I guess that's that I should go back a step, uh, sort of another... I don't know if you'd call it a problem, but development uh, during the, the development of the game is that I had a kid, <laughs> so uh, that's that certainly changed things. And then when he was about uh, six weeks old, they took him in and sort of did the standard blood work, and it came out that he had high elevated uh, lead levels. Mm. Um, and it wasn't really dangerously high, but it was above sort of the the limits that they like to see and so i bought a bunch of lead testing kits online and uh tested you know all over our apartment and found out that pretty much everywhere was contaminated with lead i mean th mostly the window sills but also the the floor even our food pantry so wow. we need to get the hell out of there yeah um so you know then basically i mean things really got uh you know development got kind of halted for me for you know, a few weeks while I was out trying to find apartments and it was just a really bad time in the market to be looking for a new place. And, uh, you know, we basically, you know, had to spend all of our efforts trying to find a place, pack up, get out of there, move into a new place, set all my stuff up again and get back to developing the game. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty, pretty tough time really. Um, especially with a small team, it, it's, it must've had quite an impact. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of weird because in some ways, trying to schedule development for a six-person team, I found, is, you know, more difficult, uh, harder to predict than it is in some ways for a larger team, just because, you know, if you have like a, a lead person like myself, or, you know, at one point we had a, our animator who, you know, couldn't work for a couple of months, it basically that, you know, when you have a team of four or five animators and you lose one for some reason either illness or you know they leave the company or whatever uh you know you can kind of spread the work out and, and cut the non-essential stuff and, and keep going forward but when you have one animator and you lose them for a couple mm -hmm. of months i mean basically that part of development is dead in the water yeah going, going back to the um steam early access stuff i mean how, how important a step is that for you to um go on there and and how is it helping with the development um of the game as far as feedback's concerned yeah 
Uh, I mean, it's been interesting in terms of feedback because you kind of get a different audience, a wider audience, people who aren't necessarily already bought into the game and who are just kind of buying it as a product to play. And, you know, they're, I think, a little bit more critical of uh, the game, but not necessarily in a bad way. I mean, it's it's good to get that kind of honest feedback. Um, and at the same time, I mean, financially, it's been good for us. We haven't really been in a position where, you know, we're worried about running out of uh, money immediately. But at the same time, it's been tough to predict how long development's going to go on. And, and, you know, it can... I mean, you know, being a business owner now and, and being responsible for a team of six people who are depending on you for income, you know, it can keep you up at night wondering, you know, are we going to be able to finish the game in time? Um, and, and not only finish the game before we run out of the money, but actually get it into the marketplace, which is a whole process unto itself. I mean, it takes a, you know, unexpected amount of time to actually, you know, get the game up there and then you have to wait for sales to come in and then it's, you know, after the first month of sales, you have generally have to wait another month before you receive your royalties. Um, you know, so like, for example, we put the game out on November 5th and, you know, I don't, we still haven't received our, you know, royalty payment. I mean, basically the sort of first month of sales is wrapping up and it'll probably be another 20 or 30 days before you know we actually get paid so it's like you have to really think far in advance about you know maintaining a, a sufficient level of funding for development mm. has has this process um as far as funding is concerned has that made you think or maybe possibly reevaluate what you do once the game is actually launched um obviously right now the big buzzword um is microtransactions and so on i mean as far as, as you're concerned that's not because of the nature of the game that's not something that would it sounds like you're, you'd be interested in doing but um post release i mean what are your plans for that uh yeah i mean we're not really looking at microtransactions in in the terms of selling individual items um i mean we've always been you know, thinking about uh, future content is, you know, selling it as like larger chunks. Um, you know, but it's, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, sort of the game economy is changing. Um, people almost expect that. Uh, I mean, 10 years ago, a lot of people really, I think, had disdain for microtransactions. And, and nowadays, to some extent, uh, there's a portion of the audience that almost wants that. So, I mean, I don't really know what the future holds. I don't we don't have any plans currently to sort of break content down as small as individual items, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure how we're going to roll out future classes. I think to some extent they may be included in larger expansion packs. Um, you know, we might have kind of smaller, I don't know, booster type of things where it's like a class and a bunch of additional items or something like that. I don't know. Does the, um, the, I mean, the way the game's developed, I mean, obviously you guys are thinking about modding support because um, that was important to you previously. Um, and the fact that it's not worked, working on a, a closed um, closed environment, in other words, a secure environment. Um, do you, I mean, does that, as far as monetizing is concerned, like we, you talk about microtransactions there, I mean, yeah. is, does that kind of knock the idea of microtransactions completely out of the equation if people are... You know, able just to do what the hell they want with the game anyway in the first place. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it certainly is a concern, but I mean, on the other hand, it's like people can pirate the whole game, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, on I think on some level, you know, where we don't have an always online game, you know, there is some level of, you know, you have to have some level of faith in the community that people who really value the game and want to support it are going to legitimately buy stuff and you know yeah there's probably going to be some other people who don't and and to some extent maybe that'll diminish the value of of what people bought but you know unfortunately we're not really in a position to to do much about it at this point you I mean, know if if you could if, if you could for example and obviously uh, money's a huge factor here and um, with regards to putting any infrastructure in place to be able to do it and even develop the system in the first place but if you could is that something that you would like to see in, in um, grim dawn well, I don't think we want to go always online, but I wouldn't. I, mean, I wouldn't would say go that far. <laughs> yeah, 
No, I mean, uh, but I mean, yeah, certainly. I mean, if we could, I'd love to have a closed multiplayer option for people, um, you know, where the people who are playing within that community could be assured of, you know, some higher level of integrity. And, and you know, that would really open up a lot of options for us in terms of competitive multiplayer, um, you know, races, ladders, that sort of thing, which I think is really appealing to uh, a segment of the audience that we're probably missing out on at this point. Mm. Well, looking looking ahead, talk about new content and so on, um, and looking ahead to Act Two. I mean, what what are we wait, what are we going to expect to find when Act Two lands? Because you've kind of expanded Act One um, over the last sort of month or so. Um, but what what's coming up? Uh, well, basically, the uh, bridge that sort of leads northwest out of town will be repairable, and um, and people can actually you know basically repair that once they kill the warden and collect the, the requisite amount of resources and then strike off north and there'll be a whole bunch of additional quests um you know the quest tools kind of developed uh concurrently with us putting out act one so i would say that we did not really leverage them to their full capability there and, and we've done a little bit more to that end in act two where you actually have uh, a, a bunch of quests where you have some choice in terms of how you can complete them and then that has you know repercussions um, but it's a basically it's a, a new sort of environment and a half above ground um, there's kind of like a more open rocky grassland with a lot of elevation changes and then there's like a drier uh, highland area that you head into which will eventually bring you into act three um, and then we have a a new mine underground and uh, ruins underground too. Yeah, I mean, I will say, um, last night I was running through some of the underground areas and they're actually pretty big. Um, I was getting horrendously, <laughs> terribly lost <laughs> running around, getting trapped in doorways and getting absolutely pounded. Um, but yeah, it was a lot, a lot of fun actually. Um, right, moving on to my next question, which is obviously discussing modding. Um, now, obviously you can't um, determine what the community is going to come up with. Um, they usually are usually a create a bunch. Um, what sort of what are your thoughts on on the modding right now? Are you guys thinking about you know creating tools and so on to make things a little bit easier for people? How how far have you gone with your thoughts on that? Uh, honestly, we haven't gotten that far. Um, I mean, this project has really been kind of one step at a time. I mean, in some ways, when you're such a small team, yet in you know, you're, each person is sort of responsible for so much, you have to kind of compartmentalize what you're dealing with or you just go crazy. Um, so it's kind of in the back of our minds. Uh, we, you know, some of the new tools that we've created for ourselves, I think will uh, be much friendlier to modders than what was available on Titan Quest. Uh, we've built a lot more flexibility into the game. I mean, like for example, one of the big limitations in Titan Quest is that you could only have nine masteries because that was the limit of what was included in the game and uh so we've removed that restriction i mean people can basically add as many as they want um the, the quest tools are all new and i think much easier to to deal with uh but they're also more powerful we've added in lewis scripting and that allows people to do a lot more um there's the whole faction system which we're still developing and uh i mean you know to some extent i feel like we haven't even ourselves had the time to really uh fully exploit these tools and and push their their capabilities uh, so you know i think there's a lot of opportunity for modders to do stuff above and beyond what we've even been able to do with the game so far so I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it'll have um, something like Steam Workshop support um, and all that kind of stuff eventually. Yeah, I mean that is something we'd we'd like to do, and uh, you know, I mean, basically once we sort of wrap up the game, and and you know, hopefully at some point as our you know, if we see an increase in revenue, we can bring on more people, and that will allow us to dedicate dedicate more manpower to things like supporting modding, which you know I think can be really powerful in terms of helping the, the game grow and um, you know have continued replayability for people over the years uh, you know as I think Titan Quest has, has certainly shown I mean people have made some pretty impressive mods for that game I'm going to talk a little bit um, about itemization because it's like a hot topic um, 
in the sure. RPG community at the moment, as you may well know from maybe Fallout, because you, you well you played the Diablo series. So, um, I mean, what are your thoughts on? Um, how, I mean, how are you approaching that? You've seen what's been going on, um, and with Loot Two Point for want of a better <laughs> word. Um, I mean, what, how are you approaching itemization in, in, in Grim Dawn? I mean, honestly, I got to say, I. Uh... I, I kind of know what's going on in other games, but I, I don't follow them as closely as you might think, uh, partially just because I, I don't have time. But the, lead, uh, the, the, the whole lead poisoning thing was a ruse. We know what you've been doing, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of itemization, I mean, we basically are taking what worked for us in the past and building off of that, trying to, you know, I mean, I think at every step you, instead of, focusing too much on what the other guy is doing. I mean, we, we, we do look, and if people are doing something that's, you know, uh, you know, a, a great idea that, you know, we're able to work into our game, then, you know, we'll do that. But, I mean, you, for you, the most part... You basically, you'd borrow it. Borrow it. There is, I mean, there's a lot of borrowing in, in game development, you know, and, uh, I mean... Hey, uh, people have borrowed stuff from us in the past. I mean, I think Titan Quest had the first uh, stash where you could, you know, shift items between characters, and, and that seems to be the norm now. So, uh, you know, it's all good. Everybody does it. Um, but I say more. I would say more so that we're just kind of focused on looking at, you know, okay, what do we have, and how can we make that better? What's the next step? Um, you know, sometimes ideas come from the community. I mean. People are endlessly talking about, you know, items and what's working and what's not and what they would like to see. And, you know, whenever we find something that we can do that we think will be an improvement, you know, we, we work that in. So, like, for example, I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do more is put more uh, skills on items, granted skills and passively activated skills with the idea that, you know, potentially people can create sort of builds outside of just the, the class mastery skill set that can be really viable. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I noticed um, running through it the last couple of days or so, um, there's a hell of a lot of yellows dropping. Um, they seem to be like popping all the time, um, which kind of give me a, it give me a, gives me a massive dilemma. <laughs> you know, do you, do you think, do you think that'll get scaled back or, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that, the drop rates? Uh, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I, I kind of thought that the drop rates in general were relatively low in terms of yellows. Um, Maybe it's just me. Maybe I got lucky. Oh, I, I mean, we have kind of, I mean, we've kept kind of going back and forth trying to find the sweet spot uh, because, I mean, on, on one hand, I would say a few months ago, probably around build, I don't know, 12 or 13 or something, I think the loot got a little bit too stingy and people were running around at level... 10 or 15 still with white items in, in certain uh, slots and not in the good way where they found sort of a next tier of common items where the base stats were better but where you know they're wearing some old thing that they just haven't been able to replace so you know we boosted it since then is it too high now I mean I'm not really sure I, uh, I kind of go through cycles of um, you know kind of intensely playing the game so that I can get a good idea of, of a really good feel of where things are um, and you know I'll, I'll do a little bit of fine-tuning and then after a while I tend to rely more on feedback on the forums as I get busy and uh, you know so at some point I mean as we progress in development I'll probably go through another cycle of intensely playing the game and I'll you know get a feel for where it's at but um, but I don't know I mean I think it's I think it, you know people seem to be reasonably happy